Hi, I'm Will Potter. I'm a journalist, author, and senior fellow in the Center for Academic Innovation at the University of Michigan, where I help both students and faculty become better storytellers. In this video, I'll be discussing character, dialogue, tension, and scene. And be sure to check out the rest of this series, It's All Storytelling, to help you apply the fundamental techniques of powerful narratives in any discipline. When I'm talking about character, um, I want you to think of any great story, fiction, nonfiction, musical. Do you have something? All right, now try to picture and retell that same story without people in it. It doesn't really work, right? And this isn't to say that it's impossible to tell a compelling narrative without humans and without characters, but it's really tough. Again, going back to that kind of primal nature of storytelling. We like to hear stories about other people. It's part voyeurism, it's part empathy, um, and also just makes it more relatable for us. So the more you can include these voices and characters, the stronger I think your narrative will be. And what we're looking for in terms of that character, that source, are really people who are gonna represent key voices and key experiences and ways of thinking, right? Um, so I'm when I'm writing a story, um, whether it's breaking news or a long form, I like to think of all the different components and, and kind of segments of that story and who's able to speak to it. Going back to the Flint case, you wanna have people who um, are on the ground dealing with the water crisis. You might want to have people who are working in hospitals or in healthcare. You're going to have city officials. You're going to have lawyers. Um, thinking critically about who your characters are is also going to expose some loopholes of who you've left out of that narrative. The big caution here is you have to be really mindful of using one voice to represent a really diverse community whether it's professional or uh, racial or in any other sense. I had a student, or several students this semester, who have told me that in other classes, they have felt that either being the sole black student or the sole trans student created this kind of burden on them that they had to speak up from that perspective. And that's a really, that's an impossible task to put on an undergraduate. And it's an impossible task to put on anyone. Um, it's not up to that one voice to carry the water of an entire population that you think they're coming from. So you just have to be really mindful and respectful of that. So John Gardner is somebody who's written a lot about fiction and, and who I probably respect more than any other about fiction techniques. And when he's talking about character, he has this great reminder. He says that the failure to recognize that your central character has to act, has to do things, not simply be acted upon by other forces, is the single most common mistake that people make in the beginning of fiction or really any storytelling. What that means, go back to our conversations about tension, um, structure, you know, diction. All of this, you have to have action in your story. It's what propels you forward. Even better if you can put people in their element. Now when I'm talking about dialogue, um, it can mean a lot of different things. I mean, pretty liberal in this conversation around it because it can mean narration. It can mean quotations, either in print or on screen. It can mean a literal conversation. Um, what's important to me when you all are thinking about dialogue is thinking about who is speaking and how often, right? When you sit down after you've collected all your materials and you're trying to craft this narrative, um, are you relying on the same people over and over and over again? If so, you just need to be aware of it. If you have one person that's really driving your entire speech or your entire proposal, you have to be kind of upfront about that and start questioning why you don't have a more diverse perspective, okay? One thing we get in a habit of, especially after you've done all these great interviews or you've done all this great research, there's a tendency to want to use direct quotations all the time, right? Um, my advice to you all is that with every direct, direct quotation from an individual or from a text, you need to ask yourself, could you say it better? Could you say it more clearly, more passionately, more succinctly, um, more carefully? And if the answer is yes, then you should do it. That's your role, that's your responsibility as the storyteller. Um, the direct quotations are for those moments where God, it really has to come from your character. 
It's really inherent to them and their experiences. Does that make sense? Another way of saying it is, you know, I hate to break it to either you or to your sources, but not everyone is entitled to a line in the play, right? Everyone has to audition. No matter how famous they are, no matter how much great work they've done, it doesn't mean you have to quote them or you have to cite them in whatever you're doing. Again, it's gonna go back to you as the storyteller, does this move your narrative forward? And you're gonna have to be kind of brutal with this in the editing stage. Tension is what moves the narrative forward. It's not just conflict. It's not just, you know, thinking about Fox News or uh, MSNBC or whatever, people just yelling at each other. That's not tension, that's fighting, okay? And that's cheap. <laughs> um, that's not narrative tension. Narrative tension is energy, it's movement, it's kind of the difference between what your audience knows and what they want to know, what they think is coming. Um, it could be tension of what your, the situation your character is in at the moment. I want you all to think about tension as nuance, not as sensationalism. Um, there's this beautiful line from um, Eric Larson where he's talking about, in one of his books, he says, the tension was subtle, a vibration, like the inaudible cry of overstressed steel. And I think that's just a wonderful lyrical way of describing that kind of a nuance. You don't want, like, reality TV, where I, of course, have never watched such a thing, but if I had, I would know that, you know, they lure you along for that full hour. And every step of the way, you know, journalists do this all the time too, of stay tuned, you'll never know what, you, you won't guess what happens next after the break. Or uh, on local news broadcasts, you'll see it as like, will these 10 household items you have in your pantry cause cancer? Stay with us. And it's like, no, tell me. You have to tell me right now. Um, but it, it, these are cheap hooks. That's not real tension. I mean, that's a lazy way out of this. Um, instead, I want you to think about building tension. There are a few technical ways. You can have changes in perspective. You can talk about changes in the actual content and what you're talking about. Um, you know, to leave off one stage of the narrative as incomplete and then go into background about a different thing you're investigating. Um, change of setting is also a really nice way to do so. The most powerful example I've ever seen about this, of using point of view and setting to increase tension. There's a documentary that was filmed in 360 immersive video um, that had set up at TED one year. And it was all filmed in a refugee camp. So right, right out of the gate, you have some tension because of the setting, right? It's different than anything most of us have experienced. But what just blew me away, and I like to think I have a really thick skin about um, stuff like this, but the camera height changed at one point of all those 360 cameras. It was up here at like an adult height, and then in the next scene it dropped to ch a child's height. And you had all these kids running towards you in the camp that were like waving at this weird Oculus, whatever it's called, 360 camera, right? And that was just, I'd never seen anything like it. But that change in point of view, it naturally creates tension because all of a sudden, well, I hadn't been thinking of the story from that perspective, right? It engaged me through the rest of that entire film, and, you know, and they handled it really professionally and responsibly, but man, that was a punch in the stomach. And sometimes that's what the story requires, is that punch in the stomach. In radio, we call these the kind of driveway moments, right? It's when you are got your groceries in the car, you're coming home from work or school, you pull up into your driveway, and you just can't turn off that news story that's on, right? You just have to hear the end of it. Or maybe it's a song that you just have to finish the end of that song. That's what you're chasing here. And, you know, we don't always get that in creating powerful narratives, um, but you want to try to shoot for it because that's kind of what keeps you going from scene to scene and what keeps your audience engaged. When I say scene, I am not talking about whether, for instance, uh, you're interviewing a faculty member in their office or in a conference room, right? That's not a change in scene. By scene, I'm talking about something more than backdrop. I'm talking about you have to place your character in it, in their space, 
that makes them kind of come alive, right? If it's, again, it's a scientist, put them in their laboratory. If it's an explorer, they have to be out in the field. If it's a conservationist, why are we not seeing them in that space observing the natural world? Does that make sense? When you put characters in their scene, they kind of, um, I always think of those little toys that are like a, a, a sponge and you have to add water and then it turns into something else. That's what happens with your characters, right? They fill that space because it's natural to them. In news, we do this all the time. The easiest way to think about it is the kind of meteorologist in the storm. There is no reason that the meteorologist has to be there kind of blown away by the storm to tell you what's going on, right? There's no reason. They could be in the van. They could be in the newsroom. The reason that they're there is because it automatically engages you, right? You kind of become sympathetic to what they're doing. It's exciting. And that's what place and setting do to a story. And finally, it really affects your point of view. You know, we have to be mindful of this. That Flint, Michigan story about the water, water crisis will be very, very different if you're going to Flint and you're living there and you're reporting the story from there versus you're filing a story from New York City. There is no comparison. Your sources are going to be very different, but you as the storyteller are going to have a different approach, right? Because that proximity creates urgency. It creates tension, it creates drama. And the greater distance we have, that really allows for more reflection, for analysis. Does that make sense? It's kind of a, you know, it, it can vary, but I think that's a good rule to go by, that if you want urgency, you have to get really close to the material. And if you want um, kind of analysis, you need to step back.